I, I want to explore with you this evening what I'm going to be referring to as, well, is this thing going to work? Let's see here. Let me just do one more thing. Sorry about the technical difficulties. All right. We're going to explore. Let's, let's see if it works. Here's technology. There it is. Tonight, we're going to be exploring what I'm going to refer to as both the enormity and the intimacy of God's love. In other words, we're going to be building a picture of what God's love looks like in its universal embrace of every man, woman, and child on the planet, but we're not going to allow the big idea of God's love for all to cancel out the very intimate and specific idea of God's love for each. It's not sufficient for you and I to say, God loves everybody, let us close with prayer and be done with the concept. God's love is not a general love for a mass of humanity. God's love is a very specific love that is for each individual as if you, by name, were the only individual in all the universe to love. Now, in order to get at this idea, I, I need to introduce you to somebody in your imagination. She's a very real person, but you're going to have to imagine her with me as I tell her story, because you can't meet her in person this evening, but I sure met her in person. Her name was Megan. At first, I called her Megan, and she quickly, this five-year-old little girl, she corrected me. She said, my name is not Megan. My name is Megan. Pronounce it right. I said, okay, Megan. I've got it. She was a feisty little girl, full of personality. And I was conducting a series of meetings at a venue something like this with a center aisle, just like this, with banks of chairs on both sides. And little Megan, night one of this very long series of meetings, it was two weeks, and Megan was sitting on the front row right down here to my left. Her mother came to me after the first meeting and said, I told Megan that there are little people meetings that she should be going to and that these are the big people meetings. But Megan has refused to attend the big people meetings. I said, well, why is that? She said, well, that's what I asked Megan. I said, Megan, why don't you want to go to the meetings that are for you? Why are you attending these meetings? That man, that man is speaking about things that you can't possibly understand. And Megan looked up into her mommy's face and she said, Mommy, I'm not going to the little people meetings because I like that man. <laughs> and I said, wow, well, I'd like to meet her if she likes me that much. And we had our first little encounter. And then night by night, she was sitting there, night after night after night. And I'd look down, and she'd be looking straight at me as if she were comprehending what I was talking about. I thought, she can't, she's five years old. She can't possibly be tracking with these concepts. But man, she sure looked like she was getting it. And then I would notice that occasionally she was hunched over with a piece of paper on her lap and she was coloring away. And I thought, ah, yeah, she's doing little kid stuff now. She's probably coloring a picture and eating Cheerios in between or Wheat Bix or whatever you eat over here. <laughs> and so I thought, ah, oh, now she's, yeah, she's in her element now. Well, the meetings were finally over after two weeks and the lights were coming down and the building was being vacated I was gathering up my things, my computer, my Bible, putting things in my bag, just two or three people around the edges of the building taking care of things. And then suddenly, as I was about to leave, here come little Megan up the center aisle from the back. And I could see her mom behind her kind of coaching her along. And Megan, as she approached, had a piece of paper in one of her hands. She came straight up before me and she looked up into my face and she said, Mr. Ty, Mr. Ty, it's the only time I've ever heard my name pronounced with multiple syllables. <laughs> Mr. Ty, she said, 
I love you. I mean, I love you. I mean, I really love you with all my... And then she had a vocabulary breakdown. She forgot the word she was going to use. I love you, she said. And she paused. With all my... My tummy. And then she rubbed her tummy. <laughs> and her mother... <laughs> from behind said, no, Megan, Megan, your heart. She said, Mr. Ty, that would be all my heart with which I love you. And I said, oh, Megan, I love you too. And she said, I made something for you. I said, I see that. And she put that piece of paper in my hands. And I am not exaggerating. I found myself looking at the most beautiful piece of art I have ever seen in my life. And I have been to the Louvre in Paris. My wife drug me through that thing for three days straight <laughs> looking at ancient art while all I wanted to do was eat crepes. <laughs> so I've seen the best art in the world, but right now I was looking at something that transcended all of that. She said, do you see it? I said, yeah, Megan, I see it. It's beautiful. Thank you. She said, Mr. Ty, do you really see it? I looked a little bit more carefully. I said, yeah, I see it. There was a beautiful blue sky that she had created in the background. There was water. There was a sun up in the right-hand corner with rays of yellow coming down. There were birds flying in the sky. And there were two people walking along the shoreline. She said, do you see it? I said, yeah, Megan, I see it. She said, look a little closer. There's a big person and there's a little person. I said, yeah. She said, you're the big one and I'm the little one. And I said, whoa, that's incredible. That looks just like me. It didn't at all. So there we were, Megan and I walking in her picture. And she said, Mr. Ty, do you really see it? And I thought, oh, I'm missing something. What am I missing? I've got to see what she wants me to see. So I'm studying the picture, and she says, Mr. Ty, look. And she pointed. She said, we're holding hands. <laughs> I said, oh, I see that. Yes, we are. She said, do you know why? And I said, why, Megan? And she said, because we like each other. I said, yes, we do. The whole time, her mom is giggling and just delighted with this little girl's beautiful personality. But there was something more than personality there. There was theology. This little girl had, in fact, been understanding on a level that most adults never understand. And I want you to enter into Megan's emotional space tonight. I want you to see what she saw. I want you to feel what she felt. Because Megan saw that at the core of reality is friendship. She felt at the depths of her soul that there is something beautiful going on in the universe, in the world, in her little world. And I want you to see that tonight. I want you to feel that tonight. Now, Megan said something. She said, I love you with all my heart. Now, my question for you is a philosophical one. It's a technical one this evening. Think, think with me. Feel with me. Did she, in fact, love me with all her heart? I mean, she had a mom. I met her mom. She had a brother that I heard about. She had a father. I mean, if she loved me with all her heart, was there any love left for them? Or let me ask the question, let me ask the question from another angle. Is love a divisible sum or is it an exponential reality? Is love of such a nature that you can love a mom and a dad and a brother with all your heart simultaneously? Is love the kind of thing that you have to divide up because there's only so much for you and so much for you and so much for you? 
I think Megan was experiencing a largeness of love, a breadth of passion, a, a emotional sense of love that was massive. And I think she was telling the truth. Now, let me just illustrate this for you with a very simple thing that you can imagine. I want you to imagine, you have an imagination, right? I want you to imagine right now, for the sake of entering into Megan's theology, I want you to imagine that you have 10 children. Go ahead, do it. You got it? Some of you are struggling. Now, of course, the first question would be, why did you do that to yourself? But once you get past the shock and awe of the whole thing, there's a very, very simple question, isn't there? You have 10 children, here's my question. Do you love all 10 of them with all your love, or is it 10% for each? Again, is love a divisible sum or an exponential reality? Now, we're going somewhere with this. We're finite creatures, finite beings with finite emotional capacities. And so the illustration, of course, would begin to break down if you push it to the extreme with you and I. If you had 79 children, for example, right, you wouldn't even give them names. You would assign them numbers. <laughs> you wouldn't have dinner around a table. You would fill a cattle trough full of spaghetti in the backyard and lock them out of the house for days at a time if you had 79 children. You and I, were humans, and so our capacities are limited. Are you tracking with me? We're finite. But listen, God is infinite in God's capacities, so the illustration holds true for God no matter where you take it. There are, I don't know, 7.4 billion people on the planet right now, and I want you to imagine with all of God's omnipotence and omnipresence and omniscience, God has a capacity for noticing and being present with and active in every single person's life as if that person and that person and that other one and that other one and that other one and that one as if each one were the only one. Jesus said in the most familiar verse in the Bible, for God so loved, what's that next word? The world, okay? Follow this. You're familiar with the text, but look at the text again now with fresh vision through the lens that Megan has given us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to notice that in fact God's love is enormous. It encompasses the world. God, yes, it is true. God loves everyone. God loves the world, right? But notice that God not only loves the world, he loves the world in general, and then there is the very specific whosoever. That's where you live. That's where I live. That's where your name is. God loves all precisely because God loves each. Ellen White says it like this in the book Steps to Christ, page 100. The relations, check this out, this is going to blow your mind. Let this register on a deep level inside of your thinking and feeling process. The relations between God and each soul are as distinct, notice the language, and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. Are you getting this? God's love for you is as full and distinct as if you were the only person in all the world to love. There is a very real sense it's not hyperbole. It's not exaggeration for effect. It's not metaphoric. There is a very real and concrete sense 
in which you are alone in the universe with God. That is how hyper-conscious he is of you. Jesus says that he, he knows how many hairs are on your head. This is, this is a level of conscious awareness of the individual that's hard for us to understand, and yet we can understand it even on our human level. Because our love on a finite level, we were made in God's image after all, operates on a finite level the way God's love operates on an infinite level. I mean, you and I can understand that when you really love someone, there is a sense in which you are alone with them in a crowd, right? If you're a mom or a dad and you have a seven-year-old child and you are in a busy public place with hundreds of people swarming around, there is a very clear sense that your love for that child makes you hyper-conscious of them in the crowd, yes or no? You know exactly where they are at all times. If they're out of your sight for even 10 seconds, your heart begins to race and you're looking to locate them. So there's a sense in which your love calibrates your level of sensitivity toward a person. My wife usually travels with me. And uh, as we're traveling and preaching, it's often the case that I'll go backstage and I'll come out and I know she's out there somewhere. She, she, she came in the building with me. I went there. She went there. Now, instinctively, without even thinking about it, as soon as I come out, I automatically locate her in the crowd, wherever she is. My eyes just scan. Oh, there she is. Okay, so I, I'm clear. There she is. There's all the other faces. But my love for her increases my sensitivity to her presence in the crowd. I find her. I can't look very long. I have to just tell you the truth. I can't look very long because the girl is crazy. She flirts with me with her eyes. I have to say to her, I have to say to her with my eyes, when you've been married for a long time, you can communicate without words. She'll look at me in that certain way, and I'll look at her in my certain way as if to say, hey girl, I'm about to preach. Quit looking at me like that, and I'll just look away. <laughs> but I know where she is. There's a sense in which I'm alone with her in the crowd. Now think about this, think about this. According to what we're reading here, God has that kind of sensitivity and that kind of awareness of every individual in every crowd. Nobody is lost to God's awareness. Every single person, not just in this auditorium this evening, every single person, every seven point whatever billion, and God knows the exact number, he knows every single name, every history, every experience, every tear that has been shed, every smile. God is aware of each one, and that is the nature of love even on our human level. And we're broken and dysfunctional, and we can understand what it's like to love somebody so deeply that you are aware of them every waking moment. C.S. Lewis says it like this, I am so, so amazed by this penetrating insight, and I hope you are too. He, that is Jesus, died not for men in general, but for each man. If each man had been the only man, if each man had been the only man made, he would have done no less. Listen, people, if you are the only person in all of the vast creation of the universe, if you were the only person who had rebelled and defected and sinned and fallen, if you were the only person and everybody else in the whole universe was faithful to God, and you were the only sinner, Jesus would have died for you. He values your life 
your happiness, your eternal well-being more than his own existence. Now, in order to really wrap our minds around this, I want to share with you an illustration this evening. In our illustration, this is you. Do not be embarrassed by the shape of your head. Everybody has problems. <laughs> Actually, I just had to make your head that shape in order to fit everything I need to fit on the screen. This part of the illustration, now track with me, just follow. You need to follow this through very carefully. This is the individual. This is you, this is me, all right? Now, what I'm about to describe to you is universally true of every person in this room tonight and every person in the world. Every human being, without exception, has what I'm going to call an inner circle of intimate relations. For me, that would be my wife, Sue, our oldest daughter, Amber, our son, Jason, our daughter, Leah. This is my inner circle. And then there's this guy my oldest daughter married. I can't remember his name, but anyways, he's in my inner circle, according to my wife. So he's there. And then we have two grandchildren, Mason and Austin. Okay, that's for Ty. Ty's inner circle of intimate relations consists of these individuals. Now, you can very easily name your inner circle. Might not be the, the same exact number, but there are two or three or four or five or seven or eight or ten people that compose your inner circle of intimate relationships. Now, every person in my inner circle also has their own inner circle, right? My daughter Amber married a man who's in her inner circle and they have two children. So another circle is being formed. This is what Ellen White calls the great web of humanity. This is sometimes described in, in philosophy as six degrees of separation. The mathematics, because the population is now about at 10 degrees of separation. The whole human race is connected like a, an internet network. All of us are connected, okay? Now, in the illustration, if you can see at the bottom, I can't see what you're seeing, so I, I hope that you're able to see this illustration. Do you see a line at the bottom of the screen? Yes? Okay. Do you see the N and the F? Okay, for the note takers, the N and the F stands for nearness factor. What does it stand for? Everybody say it out loud so we know what we're talking about here nearness factor. So with every person, you have a nearness factor which yields an SQ, which is a sensitivity quotient, a sensitivity level. Okay, so for example, with me, I have a daughter named Amber. I have a nearness factor with Amber, an intimacy factor, a nearness factor on a scale from 1 to 10 of about 12. I mean, she came out of the womb, and the doctor placed this little girl in my arms, and I've had the privilege of, of being her father and her friend and raising her into adult womanhood. I mean, I know this girl. She knows me. This is my daughter. I am very close to her. She is very close to me. If I look across the room and there are tears forming in her eyes, I want to know why, because I feel what she feels. There's a closeness, there's a relational nearness. Now, now, that nearness of relationship yields a sensitivity level on a scale from 1 to 10 of 10, 12, 15. I feel what she feels. If she laughs, my daughter, she's so silly, I love her, she, she will start giggling. She does this just to torment me. She'll start laughing, and I'll say, what's so funny? And she'll say, I just told myself a really good joke in my head. <laughs> to which I'll respond and say, well, what is it? I like funny stuff. Tell me. To which she'll respond and say, no, no, no. It's, it's private. It's for me. You can't hear this one. <laughs> and I'll be tormented for the rest of the day until finally she will divulge the funny thing that she told herself in her mind. There is something going on there. 
I want to be in the inner precincts of her laughter, of what makes her happy. And if she is sad, I am sad. This is how love works. Let me say it to you this way. It'll immediately make sense. You will agree with this. I don't even have to give you Bible verses for this because it's so intuitive. Everybody knows this is how it works. All right, here it is. Here it is. Are you ready? The more you love someone, the more you feel what they feel. Yes or no? Yeah. The more you love someone, the more happy you are when they're happy. And the more you love someone, the more sad you are when they're sad. Your emotions are, are calibrated to this individual precisely to the degree that you love them. Love, listen, love calibrates sensitivity level. So this is Amber for me, all right? But my, my daughter Amber, in the illustration, my daughter Amber has a friend named Melissa. That's the next pod out going up. She has a friend, a best friend, named Melissa. I like Melissa, but listen, with Melissa, I don't have the same level of nearness factor with Melissa. I only know Melissa through who? Through who? Through Amber. And so, let's just say for the sake of illustration, I have a nearness factor with Melissa of, let's call it eight, and a sensitivity level of eight. But my daughter Amber, my daughter Amber, track on the screen here, my daughter Amber has a friend named Melissa who has a mom, and I think her name is Julie, but I'm not sure. I've met the lady, I've never shared a meal with her, I don't really know her, I only know Julie, if that's her name, through Melissa, who I know through Amber. So let's just say I have a nearness factor of four with Julie, yielding a, near, near, a, a sensitivity level of maybe four. But, but notice how this works. I have my inner circle. My daughter, Amber, is in my inner circle. My daughter, Amber, has a friend named Melissa, who has a mom named Julie, are you watching the screen? Who has a second cousin on her mother's side in the north of Ireland named Bobby McGillicuddy. I don't even know if he exists. For all I know, he could be a fictitious character. Now, the illustration begins to make sense when we put some reality around it. If right now somebody were to burst into this building and say, excuse me, I have to interrupt the meeting, something has happened with your daughter Amber, Ty, and you, it's an emergency, what would I do? Oh, I'd drop this gizmo. I wouldn't take the stairs. I'd jump off the stage. I'd be yanking my cell phone out. I'd be trying to get her on the phone or somebody on the phone to find out what's going on. And if Amber were really in trouble, I'd be on a flight to her immediately. But if somebody walked in right now and said, Ty, Ty, we just got news that there's an emergency regarding your daughter Amber's friend, Melissa, what would I do? I say, would you all mind just pausing with me right now and praying for Melissa? We'd pray, and then what would I do? I'd continue the message. But if somebody came in and said, hey, Ty, your daughter's friend's mother's second cousin, Bobby McGillicuddy, has something going on in his life, what would I do? I'd be like, whatever, and I'd keep preaching. Not because I'm hard, mean, or cold, but because I'm finite. I'm just a man. I'm just one human being. I don't have the capacity to love everybody with the level of sensitivity that I can love my two daughters, my son, my wife, my grandsons, right? They're my inner circle. That's how it works for us. But then there's God. Then there's God. And God has his own inner circle. And in God's inner circle, that's me. I just put myself right there at the top. That's, that's me. <laughs> I'm in God's inner circle. And so with me, God has a nearness factor of 10, yielding a sensitivity level of 10. 
God feels everything I feel, but check this out. You know who else is in God's inner circle? Amber and Mason and Austin and Melissa and Julie and Bobby McGillicuddy. You know who else is in God's inner circle? That little six-year-old boy that you saw on the news when the reporter was saying that his parents were just killed in a bombing in northern Afghanistan and you see the tears have trickled down his cheeks through the dirt. You'll never know his name. You don't know who he is. You don't know what he's feeling. And yet he's in God's inner circle. God knows that little boy. As if that little boy were the only person to be known in the universe. Let's think about it in geometric terms. God's love is a circle, the center of which is everywhere and the circumference of which is nowhere. The geometry of God's love is simply and profoundly this. If you ask me, if, if I ask you, where is the center of God's love? Where is the center of God's focus? Where is the center of God's sensitivity? Where is God's love focused with all the intensity of the divine heart? Where is the center of God's love? You know what I would tell you? It's right there and there simultaneously and there and there and there. God's love is centered everywhere by virtue of his infinite omni capacities. God is omniscient, which means God knows everything all the time, every nanosecond of every day. God never has ever, ever, ever has an aha moment. God never ever says, whoa, I never thought of that before. God just knows everything, but to say God knows everything is not an abstract concept. To say God knows everything is to say God knows everyone. God knows every single thing that you have ever experienced psychologically, emotionally, relationally, professionally, educationally. God knows everything you've ever experienced as a human being with a precision of knowledge as if you were the only person in the whole universe to know. When you wake up in the morning, I kid you not, God's eyes are upon your countenance. You open your eyes, you stretch, you get up on the edge of your bed, you yawn, and if you're over 40, you have to get momentum now. So you can't just pop up like a jackrabbit. You sit on the edge of the bed, you get some momentum, you stand up and you begin, you don't walk, you hobble through the room. You feel that old familiar pain from years of sports. You, you, you feel that pain in your left knee and nobody knows that pain, but God does. The first time as you go through the day, the first time that you feel that old familiar grief, because of the loss of your mother, God is present to the pain of that memory. And the first time that you crack a smile and, and laugh because you see something beautiful like two hummingbirds outside your window dancing in midair, God is present to that joy. The Bible actually teaches what I'm telling you this evening. I'm not making this up. I'm simply endeavoring to wrap language that we can understand around a truth that is expounded upon in so many ways in Scripture. I'll just give you a few. In Isaiah 63, the prophet Isaiah is in retrospect commenting on the struggles and trials and pains of Israel through the wilderness. They went through a lot. And Isaiah, looking back on that history, says, just, just watch, this is amazing. Isaiah says, in all their afflictions, he, God, was afflicted. That's solidarity language right there. That's the language of empathy. In all their afflictions, 
he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved him now notice this in his love in his love and in his pity he redeemed them and he bore them and carried them all the days of old this is amazing language this is before the advent of modern psychology and this is telling us this is giving to us a, a very beautiful description of of what empathy looks like it's saying that God's love is such that it causes him to empathize with the pains of others to the degree that the scripture says that he carries them it's not talking about carrying physical weight it's talking about carrying the emotional weight of their pain and their their suffering and their trials what does David say in Psalm 56 verse 8 this is this is incredible it says here David is singing to the Lord and he sees something in the character of God he says to God you keep track of all my sorrows really does God literally keep track of all my sorrows the way the way an accountant keeps track of dollars and cents apparently so and then and then he says you have collected God you have collected all my tears in your bottle you have recorded each one in your book now now this is metaphoric language there aren't you know shelves in heaven with with alphabetized bottles full of tears it's a poetic way of saying that God in his own memory banks is precisely aware of every tear you've ever cried this is the God of the universe people this is God is not a stoic distant God who sits on a throne with with outstretched arm and pointed finger giving commands this is a God who feels all the joys and the pains of the world in which we live God is not only omnipotent not only omnipresent not only omniscient God is omnipassionate God is omnibenevolent God's love reaches out in all directions and encompasses every man woman and child so much so that the author of Hebrews says in chapter 4 verse 15 that he is touched with the feelings the emotions of our infirmities and, and Jesus said in, in in a familiar text in Matthew chapter 25 I'm just giving you a sampling of this this incredibly beautiful picture of God's love in Scripture Jesus said in as much as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren notice this language you did it to me in as much as you did it not to the least of these you did it not to me you know the context Jesus is saying when somebody is hungry and you feed them it's as if you fed me that's how love works if somebody is lonely and you pay them a visit to lift their spirits my spirits are lifted Jesus says I am blessed when you bless anyone because my love for them is so sensitive that everything they're going through touches me this is the God of the universe this is a picture of God worth painting that even the most hardened unbelievers would find at very least attractive and hope that such a God does exist Ellen White says it this way this is for me this is one of the most beautiful sentences ever crafted by a human being in all of literature not just in her writings this is astounding the implications of this statement not a sigh is breathed what's a sigh do a sigh what's a sigh oh. a sigh is just the slightest expression of emotional discomfort it's not what, what what's the antonym for sigh probably a scream right a sigh is oh, a scream is ah! so so this statement she's saying not even a sigh not a sigh is breathed not a pain is felt 
Not a, not a grief pierces the soul, but the throb vibrates to the Father's heart. What? Is that how it works? God is love. He doesn't just love. He's not just loving. God is love, the thing itself. God is love. God is the noun. Not just the verb, not just the adjective. God in his totality is love. And with that love, he loves you and me. Do you remember that text that we read to begin with? John 3, 16, for God so what? Loved the world. The word love there in the Greek is agape. You know this word. You've at least heard about the word. We're handicapped in English. I mean, English is the lar has the largest vocabulary of any language in the world in, in history. Approximately 600,000 words in our vocabulary in the English language. The closest second is, is Russian and then Spanish with about 250 to 300,000 words. There's not even, and the reason that the English language has such a large vocabulary is because the English language really isn't a pure language. It's a hijack operation. It's not a pure language. It, it, it's a heist. The English language has stolen vocabulary from many different languages. But we're handicapped when it comes to the word love. We only have the word love. But in the Greek language, they had more than one word. One of the words they had have is agape. Now, agape is a word for love that refers to unilateral love. Are you tracking with me? What is unilateral love? It's like a one-way street. That's unilateral, une, one, one way. Unilateral love means that God loves you in an unconditional sense, regardless of anything going on in your life. He doesn't love you because you're incredible. The fact is, you're not, and yet you are. You're a sinner, and yet you bear the glory of the image of God in broken form. The fact is that God loves you and me unilaterally with agape love. It's, it's a love that is a principle. It's God saying, I love you because of who I am, not because of what's going on in your life. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more than he already does because he already loves you at the zenith of his love. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you less because God's love is not conditional upon your moral achievements. We're not pagans. God isn't a vending machine. We don't put in the appropriate good works and then get back from him. God is who he is, who he is, who he is. And who is he? God is love. And he loves you regardless of any factors in your life. Now, agape love is vital, and you and I need it as sinners. But you can't use agape love to find somebody to marry. You, you've got to have agape love to have a good marriage. But you don't, a guy doesn't put agape love up front as the premise, you know? He doesn't, he doesn't come to the woman that he wants to marry and say, listen, listen, baby, I want to marry you because I'm incredible. I'm just a great guy, and I've got this unconditional unilateral love thing going on inside of me. So you're not that amazing, but I am. So let's get married. What is she going to say? Next. No, thank you. Get out of my presence, right? But we are sinners, and we need to be loved unconditionally. But now, now, watch this. Jesus used the word agape, 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 agape throughout the Gospel of John describing God's love. And then one time, one time at the end of his ministry, Jesus did something, said something different. In John 16, starting with verse 25, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you in figurative language. He taught in parables. Everything he taught was in metaphor, stories. But the time is coming, watch this, the time is coming, Jesus says, when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language. But I will tell you plainly, no metaphors, no parables, I will tell you the plain, straight-up truth about the Father. And in that day, you will ask in my name because that's been your habit. You need a mediator. 
You're a sinner, and I've been the bridge between you and the Father. But the day is coming when you will, as your habit has been, you will ask in my name. But I do not say that I will pray to the Father for you. Why, Jesus, where are you going? I want you between me and the Father. And Jesus whispers into our hearts the most incredible truth of the universe. Because the Father himself loves you. You don't need me, Jesus says, at that point, to be between you and the Father because mediation is not a wall, it's a bridge. And now, I have led you into relationship with the Father and restored the relationship and the thing that you need to know, the big truth, the big truth of the universe, the big truth of the gospel is simply this. God the Father himself loves you. And he has all along. But now Jesus didn't use the word agape. He used the word phileo, which is friendship love. Agape is unilateral love. I love you regardless of your sins. I, regard, I, I love you regardless of anything going on in your life. I love you because I love you. But then Jesus says, not only, not only does the Father love you with agape love, the Father loves you with phileo love. It is friendship love. This is the word that we have the equivalent of in English, the word like. My, my wife, Sue, and I, we've been together for a long time. We've been together since she was 13 and I was 14. We haven't been married that long, but we've been together since she was 13 and I was 14. We're, we're tight. I like her. She likes me. I love her. She loves me. My wife tells me. I tell her. I love you. I love you. It's familiar. Familiar words. I love you. I say, thank you. I'm, I'm so glad you love me. But my wife is a good Christian girl, and the Bible says love your enemies even. So come on, there's got to be something deeper here, huh? So one day she threw me a curveball. She said, I, she said, now I was familiar with I'm in love with you, Ty. And one day she said, I'm in like with you. I said, hey, I think you need to sit down and tell me more about that. Have a seat. Let's talk about this. You like me? Yeah, I like you. I like you too. This is amazing. I want to tell you right now, the most powerful, transformative, beautiful thing that a human being can ever experience is to be loved and liked simultaneously. God loves you. That's what I came all the way from the United States here to tell you. God loves you with a profoundly unconditional love. He loves you with such a specific love, with such an intimate love, as if you were the only person in the whole universe to love. But listen, not only does God love you, God likes you. He likes the you that you are. Yeah, he's in the process of healing the wounds and the damage and the dysfunction. You're kind of messed up. So am I but he still loves you, he still loves me. And by his love, he's healing and restoring us and making us beautiful. But all along the way, God loves you and he likes you. He doesn't just want to save you in the sense of giving you eternal life. God literally wants to spend eternity in fellowship with you. It's as if it's as if God himself is coming up the center aisle toward you, toward me. And there's a piece of paper in his hands. And the God of the universe walks up and he places that piece of paper in your hands, in my hands, and he says, do you see it? And I look and you look and it's a beautiful picture says there's a big person and there's a little person. I'm the big one and you're the little one. And if you look a little bit closer, God says, we're holding hands. 
And God says, do you know why, Ty? Do you know why we're holding hands? And I say, Lord, I think I know why, but I want to hear you say it. The God of the universe says, Ty, we're holding hands because we like each other. The question this evening is simple. Is God beautiful in your eyes? Is his love attractive to you? I want to challenge you to the depths of your Christian experience. If you have settled into rote routines of going through the motions and showing up at church and paying your tithe and dropping something in the offering basket and holding an office and going through the mechanics of being a believer, I want to ask you tonight and tomorrow morning and tomorrow night, I want to ask you to fall in love with the God of the universe with me all over again. We've taken our time this evening to build a picture of God's love. And the simple reality is, is that He cares for you. He cares for me in ways that we can never imagine. But we need to try to imagine. And I pray that God's blessing would be upon us as we settle in right now and allow this message to be embedded deep into our hearts this evening. God loves you and God likes you.